Hello, everyone. It's 701, so I'm going to say hello and get us started, and people can join us as they come in to the waiting room. Um, I'm Lisa Bickmore. I'm the Poet Laureate of the State of Utah. Welcome to this session of the Utah Poetry Festival. Uh, it's our first of two headline readings. Before I introduce the featured readers, I want to acknowledge and give thanks to Utah Humanities and the Division of Arts and Museums who have provided funding and support for the festival. Thanks also to Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks for their underwriting of arts and humanities activities, including this festival. I also wanna personally thank our organizers who uh, uh, work to help plan this festival. Laura Stott Rogers, Nancy Takis, Michael Lavers, Kara Vandegraaff, Cindy King, and Daniel Dubraski. And special thanks to Emily Grubby of Utah Humanities, who has provided the technical power and support behind this program. Without the efforts and support of these agencies and people, this festival would not be possible. I want to say also that uh, we will, we may have time at the very end to take a few questions. So please feel free to post your questions using the Q&A function. And at the conclusion of all the readings, I'll step back in to facilitate questions and to conclude the session. So tonight's reading features three poets, and I'm going to introduce them all now, then I'll let them read in the order in which I've introduced them, and we'll move through the evening that way. Jan Minnick's new book, Coming into Grace Harbor, was released March 23. His books include The Letters of Silver Dollar, Wild Roses, Poems, and History of a Drowning. Jan lives in Wellington, Utah, with his wife, poet Nancy Takis, and their dog, Emma. He grew up near fields, ponds, and lakes in Poland, Huron, and Lisbon, Ohio. He received a BA in literature and writing from the University of Arizona, an MFA in poetry from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, and a PhD in English from the University of Utah with specialties in American literature and poetry writing. He then moved to Carbon County, Utah, and taught at USU Eastern CEU, where he co-hosted a long-running reader series, was director of the Wilderness Studies Program, and is now there an emeritus professor. Paisley Rechtal is the author of four books of nonfiction and seven books of poetry, including Nightingale, Appropriate, A Provocation, and most recently, West, A Translation. Her work has received the Amy Lowell Poetry Fel Traveling Fellowship, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and an NEA Fellowship, as well as Pushcart Prizes, a Fulbright Fellowship, and various state arts council awards. She is the former Utah Poet Laureate and teaches at the University of Utah, where she is a distinguished professor. Cindy King is the author of a full-length poetry collection, Zoonotic, from Tinderbox Editions, Box Editions, two poetry chapbooks, Lesser Birds of Paradise from Southeastern Louisiana State University Press and Easy Street from Dancing Girl Press. The, uh, sh her poems have been featured on the NPR pro uh, podcast, The Slow Down, and she was chosen to be a festival poet at the 2022 Geraldine R. Dodge Poetry Festival. She's received fellowships and scholarships, including those from Tin House, Suwannee Writers Conference, and the Fine Arts Work Center. Born in Cleveland, Ohio, she currently lives in Utah where she's an associate professor of creative writing at Utah Tech University. So we'll go in that order, starting with you, Jan. Don't forget to unmute, Jan. How about that? Hello? That's good. You got it. Uh, okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. And I wanted to give a special thanks to Emily because she was so patient today. Uh, I'm very new to this. Uh, and this is actually the first time I've ever Zoomed. So uh, I hope I can get through it. But uh, uh, And thanks to everyone else who made this possible and did all the work to put this together. I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to start, let me check the time here, okay. Uh, I'm gonna start with a poem uh, about where I grew up in Ohio and uh, grew up around ponds and, and creeks and uh, uh, woods and fields and just uh, came to really love um, those. And uh, I think this, this kind of expresses it, the darkness of water. The darkness of water makes its way up from generations of leaves into a green world, 
listening to the surface and overhead to the even lighter green of trees along a steep bank that in fall drop their leaves again to begin their own dark journey as they're waterlogged to the bottom. In winter, from my upstairs room overlooking the ponds, I fell asleep dreaming of turtles and green frogs burrowed down into the blackness of those decaying leaves, wondering if the world above looks different from their world below, warm in their cold of knowing winter, wondering if some part of them in their near-death hibernation senses that faraway warmth that will draw them again from the dark center of the world to the surface and the sun, the familiar edges of fallen trees. Um, the next poem uh, is dedicated to my sister who died many years ago. Uh, but uh, when I just started college, my father and mother decided that things were getting too crowded around where we lived and they moved down to uh, the north, uh, north part of the Appalachians. And uh, this is, starts out in, in the first place and ends up on the, uh, in the second on the farm. It's called the island for my sister. I push a tree limb from the leafy bottom to the pond at the, of the pond to mark the spot the raft drifted over, a carapace of mud reflecting a dark sky, the afternoon scarcely giving way to lilies and blue-green duckweed, taking time slowly into evening when the sun scars itself to green banks, turning fallen trees into the rising mist. The turtles slip away, their dark heads bubbling the surface, a time flash of unending youth, our father's station wagon drifting in over the blacktop driveway, home from the tipple, and you just walking in from the pony barn, looking down to the island, placed that way in a picture, looking down at me as if we could leave everything as it is, walk into the house over the bridge for supper, leave the falling in place and come back the next evening, then the next until it's time to die. I walk the land alone now, past the dragline graveyard on the hill above the house, catching only a glimpse of the barn through the dying sumacs. We moved away from the war here, from campuses and protests, shattered bodies on wet city streets that wash the blood of a friend doing time in a hospital in Chicago, jumping for his parents, for the girlfriend who wouldn't say goodbye, though not for his sister who cried in my arms sitting on the back porch of their farmhouse. Out here the land moved quietly under us and the moon showed us the way home. I've forgotten how still the nights are, the whippoorwills call from an oak across the strip cut where Lizzie, your first jersey, fell from the high wall, her life shortened, you crying, unable to watch as I floated her there until morning when I pulled her out with the tractor and buried her under the sumacs. Our lives were like that then, but now, years after you died, I walk this land alone. Sumacs and locusts given way to older growth, the shale broken down into rich earth, a place I'll go when I'm old enough to fall down and spend the night with those who have died and have not walked home, but are already there and cannot leave. In the morning, I'll get up, find my way through the field to the bordering trees and drive away, leaving home again, this farm until next year, through another winter, another year, moving closer, even as I move farther away. Uh, I learned very young uh, what can happen when people, when humans in, in, intrude on on those kinds of places, and uh, uh, and I learned very early how cruel uh, humans can be. This poem's called "Looking Through Ice." A doorstop on the bottom of the pond, an iron standing upright, used as an anchor now, taken into a corridor of shale. The tracks are elk and moose, so I place them low, like the clouds that come down over the water. I remember one evening walking Yellow Creek with my father because I heard a baby's cry. He told me he was probably an animal half drowned in a leg hold. 
when he re when he re I'm sorry, when he released the trap, the young muskrat grew quiet, staring up at him and died in his arms. Looking through ice to the bottom of the pond near, nearest the creek, I see something move, a leaf in this current still flowing there, the hind legs of the snapping turtle moving ever deeper into the mud of decaying leaves. Winter solstice. It isn't hard to feel the drought that's coming to this high desert. Too many berries on the junipers, and though the sage with so little rain still looks healthy, its tint of blue has darkened. Imagine back east, small explosions far down in the Marcellus shale, or the rusted, rusted iron bear traps in a corner of an outbuilding where the winter solstice means nothing and goes unnoticed, like a lowering lake level or a water turbine on a now stagnant river. Distance is only here on earth where there are no people and the only towns are small abandoned outposts at the edge of a vast wilderness. Um, next poem I'll read is about uh, uh, an old man I, I knew, a recluse who lived in a ghost town in south, southeastern Arizona. And I used to visit him quite often when I was going to high school there and then and going to college. And uh, he, he was in his middle 90s. Uh, and I, I started uh, seeing and visiting him when I was eight years old with my father and brother. Uh, but uh, it just always seemed like uh, he was just always happy uh, and he lived alone. He, he had someone bring him groceries every couple of weeks, uh, a niece from 30, 40 miles away. And uh, anyway, this is called Return to Cortland. I, I keep coming back to him. I, I really admire uh, recluses, I guess. Uh, Return to Cortland for Eugene Yoakum. The turns of the canyon come slower the color of the evening marks an end to the distant light that made it by one rock peak only to become stranded on another. What it must be, being so alone, you talked only to the desert, the sudden storms still miles away flashing down through arroyos, the voices of loosening rock and rips of being struck down being sucked downstream, a dark sound the rocks make as they find one another along the bottom. I follow seasons with wasps now and slow when they slow. In midwinter, it's warm enough to walk into town, these few remnants you lived your life out in, the weathered boards that held the wind at bay in a dying desert. I was taking a walk up Dugout Canyon, which is near us here in Wellington, and uh, I was walking on the trail and suddenly I came up to a point and, and this huge jackrabbit uh, was just sitting right there in the first sage right next to the trail. And of course he just leaped and bounded away. And of course it, it uh, uh, kind of spooked me just because it was so loud. And uh, then he ran off ahead and uh, pretty soon I'd walk, I walked further and, and sure enough, he would, there he would be right in the, in the sage, right next to the trail, I'm you know, just a few feet off the trail. And uh, he just seemed to take some pleasure in, in startling me each time he did this. He did this four or five more times. He could have run anywhere. He could have run 10 feet off the trail, but no, he had to be right there. And he'd wait till I was right there with him to, to bound away again. Anyway, this is called Jackrabbit Dugout Canyon. Seeing blue sky through the tallest sage, he waits until you're close, then bounds away as if amused at making more racket than necessary, startling you for the joy of his first leap and how you still can't keep from being startled, pulling a, sh a shoulder back at the sound or a change in your step that brings the sky down from the book cliffs. A passage that comes with age, perhaps a dance like the jackrabbits through the sage beneath the blue sky.
sometimes I think it would just be nice to, to disappear into a storm among junipers, watching lightning strikes and the junipers coming in dark and low, an aura of rain and distant cliffs for a moment out of focus, we start back for camp. Low junipers leading the way farther west, a balance in the arms crossing an arroyo now, or yellow creek over a fallen oak, watching snags and eddies and shallows of sand or staying low among these junipers moving down from the book cliffs, we disappear into the storm. Certain, certain point in water. You set the points in water you mean to get back to, a general vicinity of creeks and ponds where only the shadows float, though soon they settle too, to the bottom of mud and sand with the frogs and turtles and the leaves they're so much a part of in the almost undetectable current, their edges fluttering one way than another as they settle deeper. There's no certain point in water between seasons in the high desert when the last south wind of autumn stops suddenly as the first winter storm moves down out over the mountains. A time when the water is so clear you feel the pool of sky and the wind at your back, islands growing wild again and moving forward, moving backward to a point in time when the world demanded green. And I'm going to end with this poem uh, called The Farm. It is a walk I'll remember the rest of my life down the wooden steps and past the well and hand pump, the hand cut water trough across the driveway onto the path to the barn. Though I don't remember it being this quiet, this is somehow right because I've learned to reach back running after the young ducks trying to get them in their, ho in their house as it had grown so wild these past few years they wouldn't last the night. Or my little boy and I carrying water up to the chickens discussing which one of us would like to look under the mean hen and get pecked, then walking back to the house to show his grandma and aunt the eggs. For several years, they were overrun with ducks, an explosion of Muscovies who didn't care much for swimming, the drakes ugly and dirty and especially mean to the hens. I remember Ian and I waiting at the barnyard gate when Sherry called her girls down from the pasture, the gentle jerseys, always pets. We'd watch them running down to the barn. The trail is overgrown now and the ironweed, ironweed is beautiful and there are so many, not so many frogs calling from the pond. The wild of the place is opening up all around. The summer after our mother died, I wonder if Sherry found this loneliness so beautiful here at last, at least sometimes comforting, a sadness she could always feel good about, like hearing a friend's bluegrass bend she wrote me just before she died, how she cried she missed her mother so much, but felt her there sharing the music and was com comforted and though alone. When I walk past the stable door, I need to look at the wall of hand cut stones where we held down the barn cats because blowfly larvae had gotten into their throats and we needed to dig them out with tweezers because they were being slowly suffocated. How relieved we all were when the ugly things were finally out and we'd put salve on the wounds and watch as the cats went off no longer wheezing from their parasites. Thank you very much. I think I'm next. <laughs> um, that was really beautiful, Jen. I love the poem for your sister. So I'm gonna share my screen very quickly. Um, and I'm gonna be doing that thing, which may drive everyone a little crazy, which is, um, play some videos. <laughs> so 
I am going to present uh, a project that I've been working on and that is actually finished. It's part of this book, West, a translation. Uh, when I was poet laureate, I was asked to write a poem about the Transcontinental Railroad, which was completed over 150 years ago here in Utah. And so what I did was I took a poem that was carved into the walls of the Angel Island Immigration Station. It's a Chinese poem. And it was carved there during the Chinese Exclusion Act by an anonymous um, detainee. And the Chinese Exclusion Act was something I was thinking very much about uh, while researching the transcontinental, because while the transcontinental was being uh, built, of course, Chinese laborers uh, were eagerly recruited from uh, the Central Pacific Railroad. But once the Transcontinental Railroad was completed, the Chinese Exclusion Act passed 13 years later. And so a lot of anti-Chinese sentiment, which had been going on through much of the 19th century, uh, reached ahead. And the Chinese Exclusion Act lasted from 1883 to 1943. And it affected many West Coast Chinese American families like my own. So I'm half Chinese. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to play you the intro video, you'll hear the Chinese poem, then I'll show you how to play the video. And they're going to tell me what you would like to actually um, see and read. One thing, uh, one quick note, every poem that is on the website comes actually with a lyric historic note that's only in the book. All the notes comp together comprise one essay. So when I play the video, I will turn to the book and read the note. Um, and I think I'll have time for maybe three or four videos. Uh, I do have um, closed captioning, but it won't work for this first one because there's so many languages of the different workers who are either working on the railroad or people who are displaced by the railroad. We a dog at Δεν είμαστε επιβάτε στο τρένο Ho so I'll play you the first video and read the first note, and then you can tell me what you would like to see. So this is Sorrowful News. I'll put on the closed captioning. Sorrowful News. Sorrowful News sings the telegram. And Lincoln's body slides from D.C. to Springfield, his infant son, Willie, boxed beside him. Buffalo, Cleveland, Painesville, Ashtabula, two coffins, 1,700 miles, 14 days on 14 railroads. One day, a great line will unite us, the president promised. Father and son displayed capital after capital, Louisville, New Albany, Baltimore, Chicago. The black trains beach upon a tide of roses. Can you believe still in the promise of this union? I saw, General Dodge wrote, a little Negro drop on his knees and offer prayers. While above, the dark news thrums on wires, gone, 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 gone across poles tall as the ones from which the president ordered 38 Sioux to be hung. Oops, let me see. I don't know why that's not working. Sorrowful news. Between April 20, 20th and May 3rd, 1865, the train carrying Lincoln's coffin traveled through 180 cities in seven states. 
Willie, who died in 1862 at age 11 from typhoid fever, was disinterred to travel with his father back to Illinois for burial at the family plot. Death is an invitation to return. When I was commissioned to write this poem about the transcontinental by Utah's Spike 150 committee, my first impulse was elegy. My Gungung and Popo, my maternal grandparents, could trace their lineage to Guangzhou, where the Chinese transcontinental workers immigrated from, though my own family has no relationship to the train. Popo was born in Ellensburg, Washington in 1910, emigrating to Hong Kong when my great-grandfather either fell ill or fled from being murdered by a rival Tong before rival Tong leader. She returned to America at age 18, where she met my Gungung at an Alaskan cannery. Popo was American, Gungung Chinese. Born in Nambin province, Gungung immigrated as a paper son to Chicago at age 15. A handsome man and womanizer, he married my homely Popo because of her English. When he died in 18, 1985 from pancreatic cancer, Popo had, held an open casket funeral, though my mother refused to let me see the body. What do we seek from death's display? The day Lincoln's funeral train left on its tour, more than 10,000 people came to watch. The bodies of the Dakota Sioux that Lincoln ordered to be tried and convicted for crimes they likely did not personally commit hung for less than an hour before being dumped in a mass grave. Before morning, their corpses had been excavated by physicians for medical cadavers. Lincoln's funeral car, one of the most elaborately appointed cars built in the 19th century, was purchased by Twin City Rapid Transit President Thomas Lowry in 1905. Lowry planned to rehabilitate the car, restoring it to its former glory, but he died suddenly in 1909. In 1911, prairie fires were up sparked by passing trains destroyed the car. Its metal couplings and window frames have yet to be discovered. The precious artifacts scavenged from the ashes. Okay, so you can learn about anything from adoption, African-American workers, archaeological artifacts, biracial 19th century journalists, the Civil War, Chinese death rituals, uh, descendants of the railroad workers, Chinese exclusion, phrase books in the 19th century, cholera, environmental change, gender roles on trains, hobos, Hollywood, immigration questionnaires, Irish American workers, labor unions, land art, Robert Smithson, manifest destiny, mass murder, Mormons, Native Americans, the Plains Indian War, photography, polygamy, prostitution, presidential impeachment, race relations on the train, the telegraph, and LGBTQ lives. So if there's something you want, put it in the chat. Um, but meanwhile, I will play another video while you think about it. I will play one about LGBTQ lives. But again, if there's something you want to see, put it in the chat. What day? On this seventh day of the seventh month, magpies bridge in a cluster of black and white. The Sky King crosses to meet his queen, time tracked by the oh, man. close-knit <laughs> wheeling of stars. I watch. You come to me tonight. I don't know why. Drunk on wine and cards, nails ridged black with opium to ease the pain of work. We are all men here. Anybody can be a bridge, little raven. Your eyes squeezed shut, but not from pain. We are a trestle, a grade we build together. What matter if you say you'd never choose me, were there women willing in this desert? I chose. I choose the memory we share of rivers, your hair of smoke and raw, wet leather. A man in another man's hand makes himself tool or weapon, says the overseer, as if a man's use to another is only one of work. Pleasure is the only chosen future. You are the home I briefly make, the country I can return to. Here, where the moon wheels its white shoulder in the dark, and you push me to the earth, slip my whiskered tip of hair into your mouth. What day? 
Canadian filmmaker Richard Fung opens Dirty Laundry, a history of heroes at the scene of a train steward reading a magazine article headlined, Canada's Railway, a symbol under threat. A few shots later, this same steward is locked in an embrace with a journalist named Roger Kwong, who's traveling across the Canadian Rockies to research his family's history with the train. The two men's encounter is interspersed with historical footage of the train hurtling through tunnels, the train moving both backward and forward at once, the men's sex overlaid on the technology Kwong's family helped build. Is the train in its disruption of time where we lose or find ourselves? My father recalls traveling back to Seattle from his East Coast college in the Transcontinental, during which time he shared a car with the young child and her mother. One night he woke to find the child crying, the mother gone. When he went in search of her, he found a woman in a darkened corridor, skirt hiked up, legs wrapped around another passenger. It changed my picture of women forever, my father said, disgusted. I laughed. Move your hands into the dugout dirt. You can feel the nestle of bodies, the soft silt of skin and hair. Translation of a man into labor. Translation of a man into need. And what is that translation? Humiliation or rage or desire? We never stop building the railroad. Okay, in the chat, let's see. Oh, obviously, uh, yep. I have. We had to put them in the Q and A. So oh, here's okay. the, it's hobos or okay. polygamists or gender roles on trains. You let's choose. <laughs> you choose. I will do hobos and um, polygamy, but I won't. Re uh, I'll just do hobos. I think we only have time for that. Um, let me see. This should be it. Okay. So some of these are not just videos, they are also um, documentary poems. I took a lot of oral histories with people who worked on trains or uh, rode trains illegally, and this is um, a, a sort of interview poem that comes from that. Dead is what they call a torn up track whose thrilling rails I jumped to bed down in the wells and feel the thud had every trestle steam at dawn like horses at the truck. I felt trained before the Phillies foundered sick. They fired the agents, but they fired the riders. Me, I love how in a well you thrum the sound until your bare lips start to bleed like canisters of oil I stole inside the train. You'll find a nation what it wants to eat and wear and what it likes to buy a ring of phones and jeans. Of course, there is no reason why to jump a train except to lose the edges of yourself, the time like pacing moxie at the track that speed that almost tears your hands off at the wrist. She was the last to go, her tendon bowed and worthless than insurance. No one rides a race just for pleasure. No one hops a train if they can take a plane, a car whose engine speed is gauged by horses kept alive in memory for sentiment. I guess there's ghosts of what we were and are we cannot bear to leave out in the desert where I'm going home just not right now, I said of moxie. Not right now before the race she has and many left in her. You know she trusts you, right? The owner said then slip me to grant and the shots. All right, and then I will end with polygamy because that's just fun. All right, and this is another textual poem to, let me see, no, no, no. This is where I admit to everybody I do not read um, Chinese. So this is, again, I won't read the note because it's quite long, but um, Sir Richard Francis Burton was an Englishman, who was a translator and a sexologist, an amateur sexologist. He was the one who translated um, a Thousand and One Nights um, into English, the first unexpurgated version. And he was very attracted to coming to Utah um, because of Mormonism and polygamy. So this is from his book, The City of the Saints. Your Republic is a land of misnomers. America, not one nation, but a continent. Your Indians, no denizens of a mislocated East. Even your transcontinental throws its yoke not across one imagined country, but several. You cannot even claim this territory of the Mormons, those bloody Hashashim, as you would call them. They're Brigham Young, a Sheikh El Jebel, planning to liberate another newborn Mecca. Just as in Egypt, this Zion, too, was plagued by locusts, its Asiatic fields demolished of maize, the limpid waters so polluted with carcasses, a thirsty mullah in this desert would long for beer. Your nation built a railroad to draw you closer to the east. Now you find the east already within you. But such a disappointing version of it. I look in vain for Mormon outhouse harems and find nothing but farmhouses in which the wives are stored like any other stock or grain. Polygamy is conducted with an air of business. The women married not for sex, but because servants are more costly here. And yet if it's women over which they would revolt, these Mormons bedeviled by a government that declares polygamy and slavery sister institutions, Congress cannot attack one, they say, without infringing on the other. 
Thus Dixie do some locals call this place their favorite toast. We can rock the cradle of liberty without Uncle Sam to help us. Absolute independence, absolute sovereignty is their aim. This deseret exclusive is Tibet to their defensive faith. Your government fears a war with China, but men out here all know the war will come within. How can you do what you do not truly know? How circumscribe this globe without a clearer eye to truth? These Mormons do not even celebrate your glorious fourth, transferring those honors instead to a later date that recalls their city's survival from the locusts. On that day, I walked out of Great Salt Lake to see its cemetery, the one place both sinner and saint might reside together in peace. There, I found a row of women tending crosses, heads tucked as they swept the stones, each one carved with a gull wheeling in the marble. Such pretty, powerless things. No hunters, like your famous eagle, though according to local legend, it was the gulls that finally came and devoured all the locusts. And I'll stop there um, and I'll put in the chat how you can access the site yourself. But of course, all the notes and all the history is in the book. Thank you. Wow, Paisley, that was totally incredible. Um, thank you so much for preserving and revealing the history of um, Utah. And um, I want to thank everyone for bringing us together, um, especially Lisa Bickmore, our new poet laureate. Um, so much hard work that you put into putting this festival together. And thanks to everyone on the committee. Um, and definitely thanks to Utah Humanities and the Utah Division of Arts and Museums. Your generous support has been helpful to me personally, as well as I'm sure many other great artists and writers in the state. So thank you. And everyone, thank you so much for being here um, and for including us down here in Southern Utah and St. George. Um, just thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, start reading from Lesser Birds of Paradise, my chapbook. Um, and the first poem I'm gonna read is called Night Shift. And I'm not sure if any of you are latchkey kids, like if your parents sent you to school with the chain around your neck with the key on it and you'd let yourself in to the house because um, they weren't home and were working. Um, you know, they called that parenting in the 70s. They might call it child abuse now. I don't know. Um, but I think essentially spending a lot of time alone um, as a kid um, has made many, um, many poets, including me. So this poem, I think, is a good one to start us off. Night shift. I start listening to houseplants, learn their dead languages. A fly lands in my soup and I eat around it until the bowl is empty. Everyone loses something eventually. My neck carries the weight of my head, buckling with the thoughts that live there. The withered mouth of the philodendron, smiling broadly. <laughs> In the middle of the night, I replace the batteries of the TV remote that has been so faithful and patient with me. Across the alley, in the shop of the garment maker, a hundred hands stitch trim onto jackets, sew sleeves to shoulders, steam creases in the seams. While I lie awake in television light, waiting for the night to end, for the third shift mothers to be returned to the children. Um, the next poem from Zoonotic. Um, I haven't read this poem in a, a while. I kind of forgot about it. And then a, a friend of mine posted it on uh, social media. Um, and I was like, well, I think I'm going to read Study in White. Um, I'm not sure if any of you know um, the poet David Hernandez, one of uh, the poet I really love to read. And um, he writes a lot of these um, study in red, study in black. And of course, I wanted to write my own study in a color poem. And so I wrote um, Study in White. And this is kind of my what I call poem noir. So. Study in white. The sheriff grinds a breath mint between his molars. His limestone thought, deep as a flooded quarry, clouded as its water after hard rain. He passes a hand across his chin, stubble, more salt and pepper now, powdered with dust, flag car expresses his exhaust. Donuts sugar its dash. A half moon of ice wanes 
and a styrofoam cup of bourbon. An officer inspects her French manicure, then stretches to its limits a latex glove. Pages of a notebook flutter in a failed attempt to fly from her pen. Socks lose their grip on the pale fact of shins. Boot prints brim with ruin at a quarry's milky shoreline. Hands of a watch meet at noon. A face goes blank. Another loses its color. As a dark figure floats to the water's surface, becomes tangible, the sun's mouth open the moment it bites through the overcast. And then we're going to go back to Lester, Birds of Paradise. This poem is called Mist. And it's M-I-S, it's um, the prefix myth, as in misfire, um, mishap, um, and miscarry. Miss. It's impossible to feed you when it can't find your mouth. An inconvenience when you pass through walls or levitate. How to coax a whale on the beach back into the water. How to rescue a jellyfish without becoming one. Forget what you learned in school about silence and standing still, about how a cricket is just a cockroach that sings. When you discover, discover the true source of your power, you might be underwhelmed. At the sight of bronze shoes, why weep? The grief and lost meetups were never canceled due to lack of victims. When you can't leave the house, call Alexa, a woman with a machine inside, or a machine with a woman inside, I can't remember which. She'll never say, it takes one to know one. So I guess that means we're still human. If you ask, she'll tell you that recovery is a kind of motherhood, where you are your own infant, your birth, a mere deliverance. And then I'm gonna, I'm kind of been writing a lot about Food and vegetarianism. I come from a food family. My mom worked in a kitchen um, as a, a garde manger, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. My dad was a butcher, and my brother owns a restaurant. So um, my other brother's an engineer, and I'm a college professor. So two of us are not in the food industry, but the foodies, the foodies have it in my family. Um, so this poem, it's called um, "The Butcher Coat." His white coat is poly blend peaked. Is summit stiff, is snowstorm, is ice expanding asphalt in the pothole of memory, is still thawing, is blizzard brocade, is crocheted, is crystal counted cross stitch needling the night sky, is kiss goodbye in a bedroom bunker, is powder, is flake, is good night in a paper plate kitchen. Is the crunch brunch lunching a styrofoam? Is steel toed punch through crusts of snow? Is boot salt grade like Ash Wednesday come early? Is glacier, is great lake, is window open to flurry? Is slipper, is snowshoe, is sled? Is iceberg bearing me on its back, hard packed and squalling on the waves? Is me shrinking in his coat in a whiteout, is only the lighthouse that sees my collision, is me in a white coat on the water, is father, is floodlight, is break wall, break wall reached by waves. Um, back to the chat book, this poem is another poem about my father. He died in 2016, so when I first moved to St. George and started teaching, um, at the university, but um, this poem is called Animus. Lots of uh, mixed up uh, mythology about what happens in the afterlife here. Animus. When I imagine my dad in the afterlife, I think of him haggling with the ferryman, refusing the ride across the river, and choosing instead to swim. At the gates of heaven, he won't give his name, demands to speak with God himself, as if God were the general manager, senior supervisor of the universe. On the muddy banks, 
of the river of forgetfulness, which hugs the murky water. I wonder if here and hereafter, he still remembers me. I'm not sure what the animals think when they see him in a stiff white coat, wandering the fields of Elysium. Do they sniff the air and trot away coolly, or do they come to lick his palm? A long look, I should think, to call beasts back into the wild, drive out any trace of domestication. What words would they have for the man who butchered them, who sacrificed, filled our family's plates? Rosy ham, leg of lamb bouquet. What lessons might I learn in magnanimity and forgiveness? And then, as I mentioned, my mom worked in um, a kitchen in a hotel and probably peeled a million um, shrimp for their endless shrimp cocktail buffet. Um, so let me just find out. Mama God, Mange. Was it for the manager as much as it was for me? For my father, for our acre of mud, for the withered rows of corn stalks blanching in the rain, for the platters and the oyster knives, for the threat of their blades, for the poaching, the pickling, for the brine, for her knuckles split and the blood rising from the sting, from her neck bowed as if worshiping the work of the hands. For the back bent, the shoulders, for a body curved, committed to murderous disassembly. For her feet raw and the boots failings. Was it for the third shift sunlight, beautiful if it weren't so ugly? For eyes and entrails, soft shells, scales, for the pe pink peach sangria and the drain? Or was it for the stoop and the styrofoam cooler? Posting its own frozen season, or the breath she held, the smoke expelled into delinquent streams, thick, forgetful, distracted by wind, vanishing before it knew where it was going. And then I'm going to move into some new poems. So um, I'm excited this poem's going to be coming out in Denver Quarterly. Um, its title is Anamnesis, and essentially, um, anamnesis it is either it's like your medical or case history or it's memories of a past life. Um, so let me just go ahead and read it. Anamnesis. I remember the last time I had fish. It was at a waterfront restaurant with my mother. I ordered a cocktail. My mother brought her own. A pharmacological rainbow. She shook from what looked to me like a little plastic coffin. It was a Saturday or a Sunday when the fish was placed before me. And when I ran my knife down the silver length of its body, it opened its mouth. Sit up straight, I heard it say, and elbows off the table. Though that was decades ago, and it could have come from my mother's mouth. My mother is a fish now like the one in the Faulkner novel. You are what you eat, they say. I would become a vegetarian instead of becoming my mother. And so going with the vegetarian theme, this poem, um, I don't know if there are any vegetarians out there or any who have tried to become vegan, has not worked well for me trying to do the vegan thing, but this is called Humane Society. Vegan fail three, vegan fail one and vegan fail two. Don't know much about those yet. The refrigerator in the break room grew disillusioned and bored with the mind numbing work of chilling our lunches. It grumbled and sighed, groaned and cried before it quit altogether without tendering notice. We told ourselves the milk was still fresh, raised the glass of it, and show solidarity to the mayonnaise that spoiled the planet, to the yogurt that poisoned the world, to the eggs that fouled the earth, making omnivores and vegetarians feel ashamed. 
And now we spoiled our appetite. There's none but the one for destruction. For the shelling of the chicken coop, the airstrike on the pasture, for the hand-to-hand -hand combat and friendly fire and the trophic war we wage against ourselves. So the next poem, um, Know Your Place, Disco Edition. First of a series I have planned, <laughs> brand new poem. So Know Your Place, Disco Edition. I feel really dumb at the nightclub, wearing pink vinyl pants with sensible shoes, compression socks with a red velvet corset, bifocals and borrowed biker jacket. A bad place to bring a cat, same goes for a headache. Ditto for a cup of herbal tea and a copy of the Old Testament. A mirror ball rotates above the dance floor, fracturing light into unholy pieces. The perfect planet for narcissists, if it weren't too small for all of us to make of it our home. Just a couple more. Got this one and then just one more. Um, I wrote this poem last week, so hot off the presses. Called Behind the Wheel. The therapist asked me a question. And I don't know the answer. I suspect she knows because she knows me better than I know what's under the hood. I've given her the keys to my inner Ferrari. So she drives recklessly down the treacherous coastal highway of our weekly Grand Prix. I open my mouth. No words. My tongue backed into the garage of my throat where it idles and stalls and fails to turn over. I hold a can to my lips and hope that it's gasoline. The therapist repeats the question and I lose control of my leg. It skitters and shakes, no brakes for the unbalanced thought. I stare at the door like it's a windscreen, see through to the receptionist buffing her nails as if this were a body shop, not one repairing heads. Tonight, she'll drive top down with her friends, crushing flowers, flattening weeds, free of the road's soft shoulders. And then I've just got one more. It's getting a little dark in here. This is called No Context. And I think it's really cool that Jan is from Ohio. I'm also from Ohio. Um, I don't meet a lot of people um, in Utah who are from Ohio or have ever been to Ohio or know much about Cleveland. Um, getting maybe a little different picture of Ohio um, with this poem about the city. Um, I fly a red eye when I fly home from Las Vegas to Cleveland, and then I take the train really early in the morning um, to my brother's place in Cleveland Heights. So this poem is called No Context. At 5 a.m. under the red line platform in Ambler Heights, you can't see the river. Sunrise breaking across the water. Sunshine warming the sandstone of the Hope Memorial Bridge. Unseen from here are its sandstone carvings. Those Art Deco guardians of promise, progress, and industry. There is a man on the street who looks as if his will has been ransomed. A deposed king in demolition boots, his coat resembling a mastodon hide. Ice Age, king dethroned, yet another mammal on the verge of extinction. Here at 5 a.m. under the platform of the red line, it feels as though nothing is possible. Here, no one ever called brushing your teeth, flopping on a mattress post third shift, a prelude to beautiful dream. I'm so goddamn, goddamned and defeated. I can't believe no one has asked me to marry him. An ambler, nobody is made in the image of God. Good morning, people of the platform, lost on your way to or from work, in clouds of your own making, hot smoke, frozen breath, your own private microclimate. Good morning, beatboxers, and to everyone, sellers of blue cigarettes, of aluminum and copper wire, and those leaning on windows, still asleep, and those propped up in the bus shelter. False friends, my high school teacher called them, fog and wave, gift and poison, on and pain, Two words, imposters, one posing as another. False friends, 
true enemies all the same. Close and closed, tear and tear, wound and wound. These they call heteronyms, impossible to say without context, like how it's cold and dark at 5 a.m. and hard to say why I'm standing here in the absence of context, living my life without reference. I recently learned about contronyms, words like dust, fix, apology. Dust can mean to both add and remove particles. Clouds dust the street with snow. Wind dusts the snow away. Murder in the first degree is the worst, but is the mildest when used to describe a burn. The Hope Memorial Bridge does not, as the name implies, memorialize the loss of hope, that naive and childish longing, nor was it named to instill it. Hope refers to the father of the famous entertainer, a man lesser known for his stonemasonry. When I say I'm finished, how I wish I meant that I've completed or accomplished something. But when I say it now, I'm finished, it means I'm completely done for. Thanks. Thanks everyone for these beautiful readings. I have a couple of questions. Um, I wonder if there's time. Well, it looks like one of the questioners has left. Let's let's give them this question. Uh, can anyone speak to the process of giving a poem a title? No one's taking this. <laughs> I just feel bad. Um, in my case, it was quite simple because I was working with Chinese characters that had specific translations. And so for me, it was about, um, to a certain extent, um, feeling a kind of creative spark via research. So, but other people should answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Jan or Cindy, do you have any thoughts about giving a poem a title? Yes, um, as you can see, several of the new poems I've written, they have poem like titles that imply there's a one and two, or there is another, or at least a few more in the series. So a lot of the poems, I just kind of, a title comes to me, and sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't. But I think titles are among some of the hardest things to, to write. I had a workshop with um, Erica Meitner at one time, and she gave me a really great handout with different types of titles, titles that can supply context for your poem right away if you want a time and a place, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, 1975 in May, or they can be ridiculously long. They can set the tone or contradict the content of the poem. Um, but yeah, titles I think can be can be tough. But if Jan, if you want to chime in? Well, <laughs> I sometimes title, usually title according to place. Uh, and other times I title by something I've taken out of the poem that I really liked that didn't belong in the poem. So I say, well, I'll just title the poem that and hope that it has something to do with, with the rest of the poem. Thanks, all of you. And thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, uh, the, for the next event in this um, festival is a panel tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. Genre as Boundary, Limit, and Blur. And I hope you'll be here and for the events tomorrow and for the reading tomorrow night. Thank you, Cindy, Paisley, and Jan. And thanks everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you for inviting yeah. us. Yeah, thank yes, you. Thanks.